and a professor on leave from the Universidad, from, from the Universidad Federal de Viscosa in Brazil. He received his PhD in computer, computing science in 2013 from the University of Alberta under Robert Holti. And um, his research is in heuristic search and planning. Uh, Livy has co-authored more than 45 refereed papers in Ichkai, AAA, and UAPS, uh, served on many of the conferences of AI. Um, Livy research led to award-winning planning systems, one that predicts its search effort while designing its heuristic function, was the runner-up in the um, a, a competition in planning competition in 2018, and another that won the 2018 IEEE Micro RTS competition. Uh, in his current research, Levy and his group are seeking to advance the state of the art in heuristic search and machine learning applied to program synthesis. So let me welcome uh, Levy, uh, who will talk about policy and heuristic guide, guided research algorithms. Thank you so much, Rena, uh, for, for the very kind introduction. And uh, I was just wondering how much time do I have? I think it's 50, you should uh, 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 consider 50, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and allow some uh, few minutes for questions. But um, if uh -huh. you allow, people may want to have some questions also while uh, you are talking, maybe oh, yeah. clarification questions. Yeah, no, absolutely. Feel free to, to stop me at any time. I'm just going to keep a, keep an eye here on the watch to make sure that uh, we're good with time. So thank you so much, Rina, for, for inviting me to, uh, to give this presentation here. Uh, I'm going to talk about heuristic search, tree search algorithms, and how we can use uh, policies to, to guide the search. So we're very used to use heuristics like, uh, like we do with A-star and more uh, classic algorithms. And we have this family of uh, recent algorithms that we developed and they, they, they can use a policy to, to guide the search. So let me give a, a very, very brief overview here uh, of the talk. We're gonna be dealing with deterministic planning problems. And I have a little animation here on the, on the right hand side. That's a Sokol band problem. So that's a, a classic uh, deterministic planning problem where you have this little man and you have to move it around so that you can push the boxes and the goal is to place the boxes uh, into their uh, goal location. It's a, it's a hard problem. And uh, here we're trying to find a plan like the sequence of actions that the little man has to take in order to, to solve this problem. So th this is the kind of problem that we, we're gonna be dealing with. And I'll tell you about algorithms that use a policy and algorithms that use both a policy and a heuristic function to guide the search. So it's a, uh, this talk is a summary of two papers. That, uh, these two papers are uh, led by uh, Lohan Orso, uh, who is my collaborator uh, on this work. And uh, one of the papers from uh, 2018 that appeared in the RIPS, and the other one, uh, it's a more recent work, 2021 at AAAI. And I'll also tell you about some of the guarantees that these algorithms they have, uh, the algorithms that use a policy to guide the search. And since I, I wasn't really sure uh, how familiar people were with uh, these classic uh, AI algorithms, I have a very brief overview of uh, some of the classic uh, search algorithms. And that's, that's where we're gonna start. Um, so state-space search problems. So uh, we, we get the problems like the Sokoban that we saw in the, on the previous slide or uh, grid-based pathfinding, and we create a search space so that we can uh, expand a search tree and, and find a solution to the problem. And maybe this is the easiest problem to, to explain what is a state-space search problem. It's a grid-based pathfinding. So we have the, the start state, which is this green cell at the top, and we have the goal state, where, which is this uh, red uh, cell at the bottom, and um, we have an agent that needs to plan a path from the green cell to the red cell at the bottom. And here the agent could go up and, and uh, down, left and right. And uh, here the path is just to go straight down and then you get to the, to the goal. So one way we could uh, solve this problem is by applying a very classic algorithm, like for instance, Dijkstra. So in Dijkstra's algorithm, uh, we're gonna be looking 
around the, the, the neighborhood where we start. Like for instance, we start at this green cell and we can apply the actions for instance to move right. And as we move right, that's gonna cost us the, uh, the cost of one. So that's one step to the right and that's gonna have the cost of one. So that's why you see this one on the, on the cell to the right of the green cell. If you move right again, then you're gonna to get to the, to the edge of the grid and that has a cost of two. So these numbers, they, they tell you the cost of the paths taken to, uh, from the green cell to the specific cell that we have the cost on. And uh, we can see that the red cell has the cost of four and that's the cheapest uh, path from the green cell all the way to the red cell. So you just go straight down by applying down, 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 down four times and then you get to the, to the red cell. But then here, we're gonna notice that uh, Dijkstra's algorithm will uh, work by having the search frontier. And we start from the uh, initial state to the green cell. And then as we, as we start to search, then we're gonna look at all the, all the states that we can reach by applying one action from, uh, from the start state. And that's gonna lead us to all those four states uh, where the agent is gonna occupy uh, the, the cells with the cost of one. Once we're done with all those states with cost of one, then we move on and we look at their neighbors. And then that's gonna allow us to look at all the states with cost of two and then three and then four. And eventually we find the solution to this problem. So then we can see like the circle that's growing from the center where we start our search. And then uh, the search gets to pass or more and more expensive as we go. But uh, as we look at this algorithm, then it, it's clear that we're, we're doing more work than, than, than we could be doing. Uh, we know that where the goal is. We know that the goal is at the bottom of the, of the map. But then we're still looking in all possible directions. We see like the circle is just growing uniformly in all possible directions. So then we need to analyze everything around uh, the place where, uh, where we started. And uh, that's just too costly. For this tiny problem, that's not a problem at all. But as we get to more complicated uh, deterministic planning problems, then um, it, it could just take forever for us to solve uh, some of the problems if you look at all possible directions. So we want to use some kind of information to help us uh, guide the search so that we can find the goal more quickly by looking at fewer possibilities that we have in this space. Okay, so the one kind of information that we can use is a heuristic function. And here, uh, the drawing that we have here on the screen uh, where S is our start location, for instance, in the grid, or a state representing the configuration of a Sokoban uh, problem. And then we apply a bunch of actions, and that's this uh, solid path that we see here, leading us all the way to this state N in, in, our, in our search tree. And uh, that's the kind of information that Dijkstra's algorithm uh, uses. And we're going to call it the G of N. So that's the cost of this path that we started in S, and we went all the way to, to n. So we applied a bunch of actions and then we add up all these costs and that's the, the g value of that node n. And uh, the heuristic function will estimate the cost to go. So we're sitting at this node n and then we want to know how, how costly will be in order to get to this solution which we're going to denote as n star. So the heuristic function will estimate this, this cost for us. And a star we use the, the sum of these two values. So we're gonna add up G uh, with H and that's gonna give us this value of F. And, and then now we're gonna search over the space of possibilities, but we always gonna visit first the states with lowest uh, F value so that we can, uh, we can rely on the information of how far we are from the goal. Let me show you an example so that this is gonna become clear. So this is exactly the same problem as uh, we had for Dijkstra's algorithm. The difference now is that the numbers, they show the F value uh, of each one of these cells that we have on the grid. So for instance, the F value of the start state, the green cell is four because we're using a heuristic that's just measuring the straight distance from the start state to the goal. And we have uh, four hops to go uh, in order to get to the goal. So that's why it, it says four. And then if you move one down, the F value is still four. And that's because uh, you incur the the G cost of one because you make you made one movement, but then you still have three more to go. So that's why uh, one plus three, and then you have the, the cost of four. But then the, the nice property here is that if we move one up from the start state, then the F value is actually gonna go up because now uh, you have this cost of one because you, you, you paid to, to make this movement go up. 
And uh, now the, the heuristic is going to say, hey, you have to make five hops in order to, to get to the goal. So you start here and then it goes one, two, three, four, uh, five. So then you have the, the H value of five plus uh, the G of one, then it has the, the cost of six. But this algorithm, we always going to look for all the, the states, all the possibilities of cost four before moving on to uh, more expensive uh, possibilities. So that's why you see highlighted here uh, all the fours, because we go straight to the goal. We don't even have to look all the states uh, outside this main path because they have a higher cost than the, the, the cost of the path that we have towards the goal. So this is essentially saying, hey, uh, we have a heuristic and the heuristic say you should go down because your goal uh, is uh, it's, it's that way. And then the heuristic is preventing you from expanding states that are behind you because that would be uh, uh, against uh, what the heuristic is telling you. So that's one way that we can, we can use a heuristic function uh, to guide the search and then find the solution more quickly. Of course, uh, things are not perfect like in this, in this example there. If we place a wall, for instance, right at the top of the, the, the goal location, then now the search, uh, it's, it's a little bit, we have to, to visit more states in order to find a solution because as we try to go straight to the goal, then we're gonna hit the wall and then now we have to search to go around the wall. So that's why we have highlighted here now the, the states with the, the F value of six. But it's still uh, much better than what we had for Dijkstra's algorithm because now we're trying to make progress straight to the goal. And if we hit a, a, a stumbling block, and then, and, then we, and then we have to, to move around it, uh, the, it's much better than going that way, uh, the, the other way, for instance. If we go to the top left corner, then we're moving away from the goal. So we want to make progress and we want to go as quickly as possible. And the heuristic is giving us that kind of uh, information. So just make sure, uh, of course, this is a star algorithm. This is the classic uh, A star. So I show you so far Dijkstra and A star. So just a very quick uh, pop quiz. I'm going to play two videos here. This is a, a video game maps from uh, movingai.com. And um, I, I want you to tell me which was which, which. So here's our uh, start state. And then uh, the goal state is on the other side of the wall. And everything that you see red, those are the states that you have to visit in order to find a solution to this problem. So let me play again. We start from the start state here and want to reach the goal state on the other side of the wall. So you have to go around. It's like a tower uh, in a game. So you can expand all those states. And then here on the right hand side, again, the same start state and the same goal state, but then we're not seeing as much red as we saw in the, in the previous video. So that means that we're visiting fewer states in order to find the solution. So if you guessed uh, that on the left, we have Dijkstra and on the right, we have A star, you guessed right. And uh, we actually have A star with a pretty good heuristic on the right hand side uh, because it knows that it has to go around the tower in order to, to find a solution. So the heuristic is really valuable. It's giving us really important information that's gonna help us guide our search uh, towards the goal so that we can find the goal more quickly. So that's, uh, that's something that we're very used to. Uh, if, if you've taken uh, an AI course as an undergrad, uh, you probably saw A star and how it compares with uh, other algorithms that do not use a source of information, uh, for instance, Dijkstra's algorithm. Sometimes it's going to show up as uniform cost search, uh, which is essentially the same as Dijkstra's. All right. So the, uh, we have a few problems with, with this kind of approach, and that's the, the, the kind of problems that we're going to try to tackle with algorithms that use a policy instead of heuristic to guide the search. So one of the problems that we have, and uh, Rina and I, we actually worked uh, quite a bit on this, uh, how long we would take before we find a solution? So we have a heuristic and we wanna uh, find a solution to a problem and we have no idea how long it would take. And although I won't give you a concrete answer to this problem, uh, but I'm gonna give you an answer to uh, an easier problem. Like even if you have a solution, a path solution, we still don't know how long it will take for a given search algorithm like A star to, uh, to find that solution path. And uh, that's, uh, that, that's a solution that I'm gonna give you today with uh, an algorithm that uses a policy instead of heuristic to guide the search. Moreover, if uh, we wanna try to learn a heuristic function, and I'm gonna tell you how to learn heuristic functions today as well, and uh, which kind of loss should we minimize? So if we wanna minimize 
search effort. So we want to learn a heuristic that when I give it to A star, I want A star to just be awesome and find a solution really quickly. But uh, which kind of laws should I use in order to, to minimize the search effort? And I will show you that as we uh, guide the search with a policy, then uh, uh, there is there is a loss that we could use that we're minimizing the search effort as we learn uh, the policy that way. So th these are the kind of problems that we have with uh, heuristic guided algorithms. And as we get to the uh, empirical section of this talk, I will, I'll tell you more about uh, other possible problems that we could have uh, with heuristic guided algorithms. Uh, so far, so good, folks. Any questions? Uh, let me see if I have the chat here so that I can I can also chat check the chat. So if, if you want to ask questions by, by typing, uh, feel free to do so. All right. Uh, policy guided search. So instead of using a heuristic, which is just cost to go, now we're going to use a policy. And what is a policy? A policy is a probability distribution over the actions that you have available to your agent at a given state of the, of, of the problem that you're trying to solve, uh, the, the planning problem. So let's say here that you start at the state S at the top, that's the root of your search tree. And then your policy could say, hey, with 50% probability, you should take the, the action on the left with 50% uh, probability, take the one on the right. And uh, that, that's the kind of information that we're gonna use in order to guide the search. And then the first question is how, how can we use this information to guide a search algorithm like A star? Like we have the search frontier and then we have all this possibilities, which one we're gonna pick next to visit. And we wanna use the policy to select uh, which one to, to visit next. Maybe uh, a naive solution uh, approach to this problem would be to just use the probability along a path. Like for instance, the, the probability of this uh, left child of the root of the tree, it's uh, 0 0.5 which is a probability uh, applied here from this left uh, action. The probability of the right child here is all, also 0 0.5. So they're equally good. I can pick either one of them. But then if I look at this one here at the bottom, uh, bottom right corner, then the probability of that node is going to be 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. So that, that will give us uh, 0 0.25. But then this node here on the bottom left corner, the, the probability of that node will be 0 0.5 because we multiply 0 0.5 and then one, and we still have 0 0.5. So this is gonna look better than uh, the node that we have on the, the bo bottom right corner. So what will happen if we use only the probability along a path to select the next node to, to, to visit then we're gonna dive into this chain here on the left-hand side and we're never gonna return because the probabilities here, this could be like an infinite chain. It could go forever. And the probabilities here, they're always one. So you always go to the next state, next state, next state, and all the states on this chain, they're gonna have the probability of 0 0.5, which is better than any state that we have below uh, this, this one state here on the right-hand side. And if the solution to our problem is on the subtree on the right-hand side, then we're never going to find it. We're never going to find it because we're going to dive into this left subtree and we're never going to come back. So instead of using this, uh, we want to have a complete algorithm, meaning that if there is a solution, we want our algorithm to be able to find that solution. So instead of using this uh, naive solution of just uh, looking at the probability along, along a path, we're going to use the following uh, cost function. Uh, which is uh, D over pi. So what is D? D is the depth of the node. So for instance, the depth of the root of the tree S is one, of its children is gonna be two, the grandchildren will be three and so on. So that's the depth of the node in the tree. And pi of a node will be the, the probability of reaching that node according to the policy. So for instance, the, the probability, uh, the, the pi value for this node at the bottom right corner will be 0 0.25. The probability for uh, its parent, the one, the, the right child here, will be 0 0.5, and so on. So by using this formula, it looks like a, a, a magic, magical formula, a d over pi. But I'm going to tell you about some cool properties that we have. But the idea is, is that this d is going to work kind of like a regularizer. So we're, we're trusting the policy, but we're not going to trust it too much. Like for instance, if we dive on this uh, left branch here where we have this chain, like an infinite chain that we, we would go forever if we just use the probability, eventually the D here is gonna be so large that's gonna make us look at the, the subtree that we have on the right-hand side. 
because the D here would be uh, somewhat small for these nodes. And for the nodes that we have on the left-hand side, as we get deeper and deeper, D is just growing up, up, and up. And then uh, that's going to cause us to also investigate the nodes that we have on the right-hand side. So that's, that's the idea of using this, this function. Sorry, do, do we have a question there? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, can you say something about what is the meaning of the policy in connection of the problem? So I, I, we know the connection of heuristics to the problem you are solving. You are trying to estimate the, the distance mm -hmm. to the goal. Uh, you didn't say anything about what is the meaning of the policy relative to the problem you are solving. Is there a meaning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could see you could see the policy as as a form of an oracle that's telling you, hey, I believe you should go that way because in the current state, I believe that's the direction you should follow in order to find a solution to your problem. Okay. Uh, maybe the policy is going to be wrong, uh, but hopefully, if the policy is giving you valuable information to say. Uh, let's say that we're putting 90% probability on the right-hand side and 10 probability on the, on the left-hand side. Then it could mean that based on previous problems that were solved with the policy, uh, we saw that at this current state, the solution is on the right-hand side. So 90% of the time, you're going to find the solution on the right-hand side, but once in a while, we get to see on the left-hand side as well. So it's, it's based on previous information that you have about the problem. The target is that the policy will lead you to a solution. Though. So if you had a per perfect policy with probability one, it will lead you to the shortest solution or to a solution. Okay. To a solution, exactly. Okay. So if you have a perfect policy that always tells it, follow that way, and then uh, you just follow whatever the policy is doing, then uh, that, that, would, that would solve the problem. Okay. There is another uh, question. We have a question by... Yeah, by Stefan. But please, please go ahead. Um, so where do these policies come from? And are they easier to get than heuristic functions? Yeah, no, this is a great question. And we're actually going to discuss this later today. So we're going to learn both policies and heuristic functions. So the way that we currently have, they're learned. And uh, I'll tell you how, how we learn them. And sometimes it's easier one, sometimes it's easier the other. So that, that's the interesting part of the talk we're going to get there. Great, thank uh, you. Yeah. All right, folks. Uh, so th that's the th that's the cost function we're going to use, and, and I I believe I have a, an example next, so that we. Oh, uh, this is based on a on a paper written in Russian uh, by Levin in uh, 1973 uh, that we use as regular riser D here. It's inspired in that work, so that's why we we call this algorithm Levin tree search. And uh, that's what we have next uh, with, with an example. So here, the, the example is, is also Sokoban. It's an uh, interface that's slightly different from the one that I showed in the beginning of the talk, but the idea is the same. You have a bunch of boxes and you have this little man here, it's a robot, and uh, the, the little man is gonna move the boxes around. And you have four different actions. You could move up and, uh, up and down, left and right. And, and then we're gonna use a cost function D over pi in order to sort the nodes in the in this frontier of search, which we're going to call an open list. So it's essentially the if you're familiar with A star, it's essentially A star, but instead of using G uh, plus H, we're going to use a D over pi, and that's how we're going to sort the nodes in the open list. So here we have on the left hand side open, and we start only with the root of the the, the tree, and we have a, a set of closed uh, nodes that we visited already. So the D over pi value for A. Uh, is one because the depth is one and the probability that we start with in that uh, the root of the tree is, uh, is also one. So that's why we have this one here. And that's the only one we have in the open list. So we're going to move it to the closed list and we're going to see its children. So all the states that we can reach by applying one action. So then we have states B, C, D, and E. And we're going to put them all into uh, the open list. And then the values that you see there, like 20 for B, 20 for C, 10 for D, and 3.33 for E, those are the D over pi values for, for each one of them. So let's just do one of them really quickly so you, you have a better idea. So the probability according to the policy for applying the action, here's the action moving left so that we get to B, uh, it's uh, 0 0.1. And the 0 0.1 probability that's going to show up in the uh, denominator 
And then the numerator will be the depth and the depth is uh, it's two because it's uh, the second layer here of the, of the tree. So if we uh, solve this, this is gonna give us a 20, the, 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 the cost of 20 for B. That's the same for C and then we do the same for D which is gonna give us a cost of uh, 10. You can see that the, the probability here is higher. So then the cost is lower. The probability here for E is even higher and then the cost is gonna be even lower. So then we're gonna do the, our regular thing like we do in A star or uh, uniform cost search or, or Dijkstra, which is the idea of uh, expanding the nodes with the cheapest cost. So then the, the cheapest one that we're gonna expand here, it's E. So then uh, E moves to the to the close list. And now, now we're gonna look at all the children uh, that we have for E. We have a bunch more here. You see the dashed lines. Um, uh, we just ignore them just for the sake of the example so that the example is, is, is uh, shorter. Uh, and let's just pretend that we have a single child here and the child is G. So then we add G to the open list and uh, uh, D over pi for G will be the depth of uh, G, which is uh, three. And the pi will be the probability of 0 0.6 times 0 0.4. And uh, that should result in 12.5. So that's the cost D over pi for, uh, for G. And then we go to the next iteration of the algorithm. We go back to the open list and we get the cheapest one. So then the cheapest one is uh, D with the cost of 10. And we move to the closed list and we look at its children. So again, we're gonna simplify and, and just pretend that we have just F as, as a child uh, of D and we compute its cost with, which is uh, D3 uh, over pi and pi is given by 0 0.2 times 0 0.7. And that's going to result in the cost of 21.42. And uh, we keep doing like this. The next one is G. And uh, by expanding G, we already find a goal. So the goal here is highlighted by this uh, green box, where we placed all the boxes already in their goal locations. And uh, once we find the goal, uh, we have solved the problem. And the solution path is given by A. And then we move uh, to E, G, and finally to the goal here, uh, which happens with this probability of 0 0.9. I see we have another question. I can't see your right. name. I, I, I can uh, see your video, but I, I can't read your name anywhere. Oh, so name, please go is, ahead. My name is Forrest, nice to meet you. Oh, cool, nice to meet you, Forrest. So I had a question about um, a policy that um, say was was good um, by your, your definitions. Um, what does it do in the case where there are multiple shortest paths is it going to assign every action the same probability or just pick one and um, yeah, go from there? Yeah, I, I don't think I have a very good answer to, to, to your question. Uh, I have a little bit of hand waving to, to, to give. So in, the, in, in our first work, we actually used a policy that was learned by a reinforcement learning algorithm. And in that case, I have the feeling, uh, we haven't tested that properly, but I believe that the reinforcement learning algorithm is actually biased to always find the, the same kind of solution over and over again. Uh, the results that I'm gonna present today, we learn by running the search. And once we learn by uh, running the search, we see a, a more diverse pool of uh, solutions to the problem. Although we still find only a single solution to each one of the problems, but because we have many, many problems that we solve, then we get to see a larger diversity uh, of solutions. So then um, in the end of the day, the policy that we learn tends to be more robust to unseen problems because we see a little bit of more diversity there. So that's kind of my, my hand wavy uh, uh, answer to your question. Does that make sense, uh, Forrest? Yes, you know, it was something I was, I was thinking about, um, you know, this is really interesting with uh, using a policy. And one thing I was thinking about, especially with irreversible um, actions like we have in soccer band, like you can push, but you can't pull. Um, you could run into a situation where you make a mistake, um, but from there, you're pretty sure how to get back to the goal and everything is like, okay, you just have to take, there's only one action at every step. So you have like probability of one, one, one all along the way. But maybe if you go the shortest pathways, maybe there are 30 different ways you could get there. And so the probability, you know, is um, split across those 30. And so it has low probability for each one, but it's actually a shortest path. And so then the algorithm would think, oh, you know, just like take this wrong move and then go around. But, um, you know, maybe there's a way to correct for that because, you know, I do agree in a lot of situations, learning a policy is probably just a lot easier than learning a heuristic function. 
So um, I was just wondering if uh, mm -hmm. there, there was any theory or anything about maybe, that. Maybe we should postpone such questions to the end. And okay, yeah, sure. Things cool. will yeah, be no, I'll, cool, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to, to take it offline as well for us. This is a very interesting issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any, any questions, folks, about this, this example here? All right, so th this is a, a running example uh, for uh, Levin Tree Search. I, I wrote LTS, sometimes I'm going to write Levin TS, but it's, it's the same algorithm. So we're going to use the d over pi uh, function to, to sort the nodes in the open list. And uh, the cool thing about this, this algorithm is that we have a bound on the search effort once, once you have the solution. Uh, and that's actually worked for any node that you have in the, in the tree. So as you look for this uh, fraction here on the left-hand side, our cost function d over pi, then the d over pi value, it's actually an upper bound on the number of nodes that you have to expand before you expand that node. So for instance, if you look at N1 here on the tree on the right-hand side, then uh, its, uh, its cost is roughly 19. So then we know that at most 19 nodes we have to be expanded before we get to, to N1. So the cost function itself, it's an upper bound on the number of nodes you have to expand before you expand that node. So if you have a bunch of different solutions, then you're gonna get the, the cheapest solution according to the Levin cost d over pi, and that's an estimated number of nodes you have to expand in order to solve that problem. And uh, this has some um, very interesting uh, implications. For instance, if you want to learn the policy, now we have something to optimize so that we can try to reduce the search effort before uh, finding a solution to this problem. And I'm going to try to give a little bit of intuition. I won't show you the proof uh, of wh why this bound works, but I'll, I'll try to give you some intuition of how, how the proof goes. So remember, we have this d over pi, and d over pi is, uh, is our bound. So let's uh, break down into two parts. So the, 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 the first part is this 1 over pi. So 1 over pi is actually giving us the maximum number of trajectories that we have from the root of the, the tree all the way to the leaves with probability at least pi. So let me give an example to, to make this a little bit more clear. We have this binary tree, and let's say that the policy is always saying, uh, half and half for each one of uh, uh, the, the, the child. And, and then let's look at N1. So what is, what is one over pi for N1? So one over pi for N1, I think I have the formula here. It's uh, one divided by uh, one divided by four, which is four. So then that's the maximum number of different paths that we have with this probability at least uh, pi. If we traverse all the way from the root of the tree all the way to the, to, the, to the leaves of the tree. So that's the maximum number uh, that we have. Here, it happens to be exactly the same number because we have this uh, uniform uh, distribution according to the, to the policy. Let me give you another example so that we can contrast with this one and then it might be easier for us to understand. I just changed slightly the, the example above. Now, uh, the, the child on the right, it has an extra child, which is N1, and the probability changes here as well. So the, the first uh, child here from this, uh, the, this node has probably one over five and then one over five and three over five. So then if we look at N1 right now, then uh, the math that we do here, it's one divided by uh, one divided by 10, which is if we multiply one half by one fifth, then we have one, uh, one divided by 10. And if applied to our formula, one divided by pi, that gives us 10. What is this 10 telling us? It's telling the maximum number of paths that we have, trajectories from the root of the tree all the way to a leaf with the probability at least, uh, at least pi. So here uh, in our first example, it was actually a, a pretty good estimate for the second one was pretty bad. Uh, we only have five different trajectories here, but uh, we're fine, we're estimating to be 10. And that's because the probability here, it's a small probability. Uh, one over five compared to one over two on the left-hand side of this tree. So because we didn't split much on the left-hand side, then uh, our estimate here was a little bit off. But if we had similar split here on the left-hand side, then we would get uh, a, a better estimate of the number of trajectories that we have. So this one over pi is essentially telling us how many different trajectories that we have from the root all the way to the leaf 
where uh, we have the probability of at least the, the value of pi. And in this case here, the value of pi was one over 10 because this is trajectory that we follow all the way down here. So once we have the maximum number of trajectories, then we can estimate the size of the tree if we account for the number of nodes that we have along a trajectory. And that's a D component. So the one over pi tells us the number of trajectories and the D is gonna tell us how, how many nodes that we have in each trajectory. And as we join them, then now we have an upper bound on uh, the size of the tree. So then I'm, I just split the two here so it's easier to see. So on the right hand side, one over pi, that's the number of trajectories and D is the number of nodes that we have in each trajectory. And as we join both of them, then that's gonna be an estimated number of uh, nodes. It's actually an upper bound on the number of nodes that we have in this tree uh, for, uh, before we, we expand the node with the probability uh, pi of n. So that's a little bit of an intuition. Uh, if that uh, it's still a little bit unclear, uh, you, can, you can trust me or take a look at the paper for the proof. Uh, some folks, they find it easier to, to, to gain intuition by reading the proof. But the idea of the proof is exa exactly this. Uh, you count the number of possible trajectories, and then you transform this uh, with the, the, the size of the, tra the trajectory, and that's going to give you an upper bound on the number of nodes expanded. So that's a, a little bit of intuition of why this bound uh, works. All right, uh, so a few, few more examples. If we get this tree here, it's a binary tree with this uh, uniform probabilities. Then the actual size of the tree is two times two uh, to the power of D. And the bound is given by D over pi, which is given by D times two to the D. So it's not exactly uh, the same number of, uh, of nodes, but it's not too bad. Like uh, uh, we're missing, instead of a two here, uh, we have a D. So we're missing by a constant factor. So it's, uh, it's not bad at all. It's gonna be perfect if we have a chain, because if we have a chain, then the actual size would be D and the bound d over pi is going to be exactly uh, d because the probability along the path will be will be exact. So these two cases, they're they're good cases. The one on the right uh, were not too bad. The one on the left were just perfect. And uh, when things are going to go uh, bad or really uh, wrong, well, one one of the examples that I gave you on the previous slide, where we have a bunch of branching on the right hand side, just a little bit of branching on the left hand side, that's where uh, the the bound is going to be tricked. And, um, and then we might be uh, by, by a little bit more than what we're missing here, just a constant factor uh, related to, to these two here. All right, so the, these are a few examples of, of the bound, how it works, and a little bit of intuition. But if, if you really want to understand what's going on, then reading the proof might be the, the, the best way to go. OK. What if the policy is wrong? So now we have this algorithm, it all looks great. Uh, we have a policy, the policy is guiding the search, we have a bound and we know how it works, but what if the policy is wrong? For instance, uh, I, I think that's where uh, Forrest was, was, was touching upon uh, in, in his question. Um, maybe the, the policy is just misleading. You could set the probability of a path to the goal to be zero and then um, you're just doomed, right? So one thing that you could do is to mix different policies and that's something that we actually had to do, uh, going back to Forrest's uh, question, uh, when we learn the policy with a reinforcement learning algorithm and we apply it to Levin tree search, then sometimes we're just lost because maybe the policy is just not good enough. But as we mix with a uniform distribution, then we're able to get much better results. So we could say, you know, I'm going to put a 90% weight on the policy that I learned with a reinforcement learning algorithm and 10% weight on the policy uh, given by a uniform distribution. So that way you're gonna prevent having all those paths with a zero probability. And then I'm never gonna be too sure about a path that I have to follow. So it's a way of making the, the search more robust uh, that way. Uh, maybe you have to expand more nodes because you're not trusting as much your policy, but at least you know that you won't run into problems like having a path with zero uh, probability. And then you would never be able to find a solution that way. So there are a few tricks that we could play uh, with uh, these kind of uh, policies. Uh, we have a bunch of details about this in the paper as well. Here, I'm just uh, touching the, the, the subject. All right, uh, so now, now we're getting uh, into the, the second part of the talk, which is uh, related to how to use a, what we call the, the cost to go. So we, we discussed A star 
a star, we're expanding all these nodes along the path. And then we see this node N in the, in the middle of the path and we can use a heuristic. So then we have the G, which is the cost that we, we've seen happening and H is the estimated cost to go. So then we, we can use F. If we draw a picture for live and tree search, then it's gonna look like this. You have your start state and then you do a bunch of work and that's your tree there represented by the triangle. And then you get to a node N and the information that, you, that you're gonna use in order to decide, am I gonna expand N or not? It's solely based on the information that you've seen already during search, which is our D over pi. But then we're missing very important information here, which is how much effort that we still have to go uh, Laving tree search is using the policy on the first bit of the search, but we're not using any information for the remaining part of the search. So maybe this compares better with Dijkstra than uh, with, with ASAR because we're only using what we've seen already uh, during search. So in addition to using this, uh, we're gonna try to estimate the effort that we still have to go. So uh, if we continue searching from N, how much effort that we have to uh, uh, to, to do in order to, to find a solution, in order to find our, our N star. So that's why I had this question mark. Uh, what we should use in order to replace this so that we have a better guidance of, of the cost to go. So that's the idea of what we call policy guided heuristic search. So now instead of just using the policy, we're gonna mix them up and we're gonna use both a policy and the heuristic because the heuristic is still giving us uh, information that we're not using with the, the policy guided search. So we're still gonna be using the D over pi, which is the, what we know, what we've seen during search. But now we would like to use the estimated cost to go, which is, uh, which is H. So uh, we, we know that uh, this H function is telling us, hey, you still have this much to go. And we could use the same cost function to say, you know what, I still have this much to go. I know that my pi is gonna be at least pi of n. So then I can add this function to the function that I had before. So if my n is really far from the goal, according to the heuristic, then it's gonna have a higher lagging cost. If it's really close to the goal, then it's gonna have a lower lagging cost because the h is gonna be smaller. So now we're mixing the idea of using the search effort that we've seen so far with the idea of how much we still have to go. And we add them up and now we have a D plus H uh, over pi. So that's the idea of the PHS uh, algorithm. We can uh, play around with this formula. I'm not sure if this is too important, but uh, we just start here with the formula, we're gonna call it var, var phi and we have D plus H over pi. If we multiply by D over D, then we can rearrange this so that we can get uh, the Levin bound and we get this uh, eta that uh, is our heuristic factor. So the heuristic factor is uh, based on the heuristic function, which is the effort that we have to go. And we're multiplying this by uh, the, the Levin cost that we had before, the, 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 the D over pi. And this, this letter here is gonna be important because we use it in a bound that we have for uh, PHS. So now we're gonna be using a, the same idea. Uh, we have an open list, but instead of sorting the nodes in the open list by D over pi, we're gonna sort the, the nodes in the open list by D plus H over pi. So that's, that's how we change the cost function uh, for this algorithm. And we can show the following bound. The number of nodes uh, this algorithm has to expand before finding the solution N star is bounded above by this formula. So I'm gonna break this down for you uh, I, I know that I showed uh, Ada there for you. Now I have this uh, plus symbol. Uh, I know that Rina will understand this. Maybe other folks won't, but this is uh, using path max uh, in this Ada value. So all the details are in the paper, but we can propagate down the tree uh, like we do with path max in, in A star with inconsistent heuristics. But you can see this still as the, as the heuristic factor for, uh, for the algorithm. And here's, uh, here's the Levin bound that we're really used to it. And uh, that's what we had before. But then now we're multiplying this Levin bound by two other factors. And these two other factors are related to the heuristic function. So the first factor is the, the cost of the heuristic. And this value, unfortunately, is greater than one. So by being greater than one, we were actually hurting the search. So that's when the heuristic function is actually making our life harder by uh, making us expand more states before we find a solution. 
And the good news is the summation here. So the summation, this capital L, is all the leaf nodes that we have in the tree. So this is the heuristic gain. So it's how much the heuristic is going to actually save us from expanding more nodes in the tree. So uh, the heuristic can help. That's the right-hand side. But the heuristic can hurt. That's uh, the one that you have in the middle with the cost of heuristic greater than one. The good news is, and uh, this is something that I find really cool, is that uh, if we show that the heuristic is admissible, this goes away. And uh, admissible in the PHS sense. Uh, so we have this new definition of um, uh, an admissible heuristic. If you're familiar with uh, an, a heuristic that's admissible in the A star sense, then we have a new definition for uh, admissible heuristics, which is uh, the definition based on the Levin cost. But the cool thing is if the heuristic is admissible like for A star, then it's also admissible for PHS. And if that's the case, then this uh, factor that hurts us is just gonna go away. So then the heuristic is only helping us. So if you use an admissible heuristic with PHS, then it can only help and it's never gonna hurt you. That in terms of number of nodes in the tree. Now we know that if the heuristic is super expensive, then the running time could go up because we're paying a higher cost for each node that you expand. But in general, the search tree is gonna shrink as you apply uh, the D plus H divided by pi instead of just using the uh, D divided by pi. So it's a win-win situation if you use an admissible heuristic. Okay, so that's uh, PHS, but we're still not happy. So that's why we have PHS star. We're still missing a, an, an important component here. So here's uh, uh, PHS. We have uh, the, the cost to go, uh, which is uh, this uh, H divided by pi. We have the, the living cost, but we do have a problem here because in the end of the day, we're trying to estimate the probability of the solution node. We're trying to estimate the pi of N star because that's the, the total search effort that we have to, to pay. So if you're looking at this, this node N, I would like to know what is the cheapest solution according to the Levin cost that I have in this subtree. So if I keep working uh, through the subtree of N, I wanna know what is the cost that I have to pay. And uh, right now we're just using pi. By using pi here with H, we're assuming that the probability along the path that we still have to go is not gonna change. And that's certainly not the case because uh, our policy is never so sure. So then as we go down and down this tree, then this uh, probability is gonna get smaller and smaller as we go. But for PHS, we're using the, the good old uh, pi of n. So uh, pi of n star is often much smaller than pi of n. So we would like to estimate what is the pi of n star. So what is the cost that we still have to go for expanding this subtree here? So we're gonna do this as follows. We're gonna use the, the average probability along a path. Uh, I see you have uh, 10, uh, 10 minutes, maybe including questions. So I'll, I'll wrap up with this algorithm and maybe skip the, uh, the empirical results. But uh, th this part here is, is interesting enough. So let me, yeah, go ahead. let me continue here. So we're gonna use uh, the average probability along the path that led us all the way to N. And that's given by N to the power of one over D. So it's, uh, if we get any node here along this path, from the, the root of the tree all the way to n, then uh, the average the average of the probability for reaching a node in one step is given by this. So once we have this, then we're just gonna assume that every single step that we still have to go from n all the way to n star will be given by this average. So then now we can use the following. Now we can add up the distance that we went, uh, went through already, which is d, and the distance to go, which is h and uh, then use the probability, the average probability that we've seen so far. So we're essentially trying to approximate what, a, what is a pi of n star. And it's given by this formula right here. Um, and once we have this, then we have a new cost function. So instead of using d plus h over pi, now we have d plus h over pi to the power of this factor. So that's the, what I like to call the probability to go. So the exponent that we have for pi here is a probability to go, is how much the probability is gonna decrease from n all the way to n star. So we're being more aggressive. Uh, the bound with the admissible heuristic doesn't hold anymore, but the bound with the, the middle term still holds. So we still have a bound on the number of nodes expanded if we use this 
uh, approximated cost function uh, that we have here on the screen. All right, so uh, I promise that we, uh, I will tell you how we learn heuristics. This is uh, super quick. It's a very cute algorithm and uh, maybe I should spend two minutes explaining it. So it's, a, it's called the bootstrap uh, method. We have a set of problems and that's how we're gonna learn policies and heuristics. So these are the, the set of tasks that we have on the left-hand side. And we have a search algorithm, for instance, Levin Tree Search and a model that we wanna train like this neural network here. And uh, we're gonna fix a budget. The budget could be, for instance, the number of states that we're gonna expand before, before we either solve the problem or we give up. And so we, we start here by uh, trying out with some random uh, initialization, initialization of the neural network. So the policy is not gonna be so great. The heuristics are not gonna be so great, but we use it nevertheless. So we do the search and maybe some of the problems we can actually solve. And then they become training data like that one. So for that, that one problem, we know a path from the start state all the way to the goal. So then we know exactly which actions we should take. So we, as, as if we had the label for all those actions taken along the way. And then we do this for each one of the, the problems that we have. Some of them we're able to solve. Some of them are too hard and then we give up. And, oh, this is too hard too. And another too hard. Okay, we solve uh, three problems. Once we solve the three problems, then we can go to the neural network and adjust the weights. So now we have some training data and we train the neural network. So now we have a better policy, a better heuristic based on the training that we did. So we can go back and try the problems that we couldn't solve in the previous iteration. So we try again, although we have a better policy now, we couldn't solve any of these problems. So what we do? Well, we increase the budget instead of searching for X nodes, we got to search for two X nodes. And, uh, and then we try again, because now we have a better policy and more uh, search to be done, then we're able to solve, well, all the problems. So as we solve all the problems, then we adjust again the, the, the weights of the neural network and uh, we go training like this. So we have a very large uh, set of problems and then we try to search them, uh, solve them. The ones that we solve, they become training data and then we update the weights of the neural network the ones that we can't solve, we try to solve them later with a better policy, a better heuristic and so on. So that's, that's how we learn uh, policies and heuristics. I have uh, a bunch of experimental results. Uh, I can just tell you that uh, things are interesting uh, and, but maybe I should stop now and uh, see if you have questions. Can you say more about the experiments? What, what, what I mean, explain <laughs> one, uh, what, uh, what do you compare against yeah. and what are the results? Absolutely. Let me just, just skip this. So the kind of comparisons that we made was, uh, so we have PUCT. PUCT is an algorithm that uses both a policy and a heuristic function. So it needed to be compared. We have Levin Tree Search, which is the first one that I explained today. PHS, PHS star, and then we have weighted A star and uh, greedy best for search. So these are the algorithms that we tried. We tried in uh, Sokoban, uh, The Witness, which is a co commercial game. Maybe, you, maybe you've played this game before and the five by five sliding tile puzzle. And in the learning, uh, learning scheme that we have, um, we have a bunch of training instances which will apply uh, the bootstrap method. For the loss functions, uh, we can actually use the bound as a loss function for, for training the policy. So as we adjust the weights of the neural network, we're really trying to reduce the search effort by uh, uh, adjusting uh, the weights based on the, on the training data and then minimizing the search effort. For PUCT, we use cross entropy, if you're familiar with this. And for all the heuristics, we do what uh, people normally do which is a mean squared error. So we're trying to minimize the distance of the predicted heuristic uh, with, the, with the actual distance to go that we have from, from our training data. So that, that's, that's a cool part that I like about the search algorithms, PHS, Levin G search, is that we, we actually have a loss function uh, in order to, uh, to minimize the search effort. So let me just show you uh, one example where uh, it's, it's really cool, the one on the, the right here for the witness so the witness is a kind of problem that's much easier to learn a policy than learning a heuristic. If you play the witness, maybe you're saying, hey, yeah, uh -huh, that makes sense. Uh, if you haven't played, uh, maybe, maybe you should check it out. It's a fun game. But learning a policy is much easier here. And that's why we see these uh, three lines. They represent a Levin tree search 
and the PHS star and PHS. PUCT is doing reasonably well as well, and it also uses a policy. By contrast, the sliding tile puzzle, the one in the middle, it's much easier to learn the distance to go than to learn a policy. So that's why we see uh, weighted A star being the, the best one. Uh, maybe I was too quick here and I forgot to say that the Y axis is the number of problems unsolved. So it's still the number of problems that we have to, to solve. So getting to the bottom as quickly as possible, uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's good. Uh, if if the, the curves they get to the bottom really quickly, that means that the method is doing well. And uh, the P here, this red line, it's a pH star. So it struggles a little bit because it's trying to learn these two things, like the policy and the heuristic at the same time. But eventually the heuristic helps a lot. So that's why it's able to eventually learn a really good policy and a really good heuristic. And finally, Sokoban here, uh, that's where a PHS star tends to, to perform better. It gets uh, almost all the way to the bottom here. So this is uh, the training, training results. Uh, if you're interested, we also have test results where we go on and we try the policies and heuristics on uh, data that we didn't see during training. Uh, maybe I should stop again and see if we have uh, questions. We still have two minutes to go. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, PUCT looks like it does really badly um, on these first two environments. So is that because um, sort of the policy is not great and it's being led astray by the policy? Uh, and are there any sort of environments where you could see uh, PUCT uh, perform better than these other approaches? It seems like it has a benefit where it sort of updates its heuristic uh, based on the neighbors, uh, which these other methods don't have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the main issue with P. UCT here is that it's it's very slow, and uh, that's something that Lohan and I we, we discussed quite a bit of how to make a, a fair comparison with PUCT, because the kind of problem that we're trying to solve we we try to find the whole path and solve the planning problem, and and then we're done. And PUCT really shines when we're playing games like uh, you have some budget and then you have to make a move. And then you have some budget and then you have to make another move. And by making all these moves, the, the search tree is actually getting smaller. Uh, you don't have to plan too far ahead into the future. And in this case here, because we plan the whole thing at once, then we're, you have to plan quite far ahead into the future in order to, to find a solution. And the idea of going back and forth like UCT does for updating the weights, that just takes, takes forever. So it's, it's just a slow method. Um, when you when you have the the other all the other approaches actually A star greedy best first 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 search uh, Levin tree search PHS they all use a, an open list and the open list is much more efficient that way you just say give me the next node and then uh, there you go there is a next node to be expanded PUCT you have to go back and forth what is the next node I don't know you have to go down the tree and then figure it out so then it's much slower that way so uh, I believe that's the reason why. Uh, PUCT doesn't doesn't perform as well. Let me just skip ahead here. I have, if we skip the training part, and now we just fix the the policy that was learned by PHS, and and then we can look at PUCT with a fixed policy. It does much better. Like it solves almost all Sokoban's. Uh, it solves all the witness that we see here in the middle, and it does reasonably well with this lining tile puzzle. So once, once you have a trained uh, policy and a trained heuristic, then PUCT does all right. But the problem is when you're learning and you have a weak policy and a weak heuristic, it just takes forever. That's why the, the learning curves there uh, are not so great. But as you pick a policy and a heuristic and you plug into PUCT, then, then it, can do, uh, it can do well. But if we're dealing with games with this idea of doing multiple steps and making the, the trees smaller, then I think it would be much better than what we see here. So it's more a difference of doing this uh, two-player games versus a single agent problem. Th th does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks. And I was kind of surprised on this slide. It looks like it's even worse with uh, expansions. Um, you'd think that maybe on some games it would, it would be pretty good and efficient with having less expansions, um, but I guess not. Yeah, that's a that's a cool. It's not the worst one necessarily, but it, it does pretty bad in some cases. And uh, 
we should take all these results. Uh, th these results, they're actually not in the paper. Uh, these are some, some extra results we have uh, because uh, these models are trained for PHS star. And then we're maybe if we had a really good model trained for PUCT, it wouldn't expand as many nodes as we see here. So you, you, should, you should take that into account when, when reading these numbers. So the, the test numbers for the models trained for each one of the algorithms are these ones. And then it's just following the same uh, story that we saw in the, on the learning curves from the, from the other slide. So PUCT is just uh, doing really badly here. And it's probably because, uh, except the witness. So here you can see uh, the witness where it does really well. So the policy here is really helpful. Like learning a policy for, for this domain is, is super helpful. And uh, learning heuristic for this lighting tile puzzle is super helpful. So that's why it's a good idea to learn both. So you should learn both, uh, both a policy and a heuristic, because then uh, your method is going to be more robust that way. So you can, you can deal better with different scenarios if you learn both a policy and a heuristic. Any more questions, folks? I, I have one more question, but uh, if uh, for some people time is uh, uh, late, they obviously uh, we can leave. So first, I would like uh, all of us to thank Libby for really a great talk. And then I have a question. Uh, you, what is a little bit puzzling here to me is that you have both policy and heuristic in this new algorithm, and they are sort of not connected. At least I don't see you connecting them in a, in a way that is clear. And normally the policies and heuristics are very well connected in reinforcement learning. For example, you learn the heuristic and the policy is guided by the heuristic. So uh, what about this uh, 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 connecting it to this uh, idea that the policy is some randomized uh, uh, guidance by the heuristics or something like that? Is there a relationship? Or what can you say about the connection of policies and heuristics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's something that we wondered for, for a little while because um, before getting through the trouble of actually learning all these policies, we wanted to try like the easiest uh, thing possible. And the easiest thing possible would be to just get the, all the heuristics that we know and, and love and transform them into policies. But we didn't figure any, any good way that we, we felt like uh, this, this is gonna work to get a heuristic and transform into, into a policy. We could get those numbers and maybe normalize them and create a policy out of them, but it felt uh, not strong enough. And we actually never tried. We decided to go right away for, for learning so that we could learn uh, both a policy and heuristic. But maybe, maybe it works. Maybe uh, transforming the heuristic into a policy could, could, be, could be helpful. I'm just not sure if it's helpful in the sense of providing extra information because uh, the, the beauty of learning both of them is that they complement one another. Uh, sometimes maybe in a given state, it's really hard to learn a policy for, for that state, but it, maybe it's easier to, to, to learn a heuristic. And then you go ahead and you learn the heuristic. But if all the information comes from the same source, then I'm not sure we have a lot of diversity, but it's definitely something that should be investigated. Thank you. Does that answer, uh, Rina? Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I have some more questions, but we can take it offline. Uh, I think uh, there are also connections with CNUP scheme and, abstract, and type system that uh, you know about, but we can take it offline uh, later on. No, oh, that sounds like a very interesting conversation. Let's, let's have it. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Libby. Thank you again. And uh, let's thank Libby once more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Th thanks for, for, 